Good afternoon and welcome to the fifth plenary session. I trust all of you had a good lunch and perhaps uh, to, to break the, uh, the tendency to sleep, let me just start this uh, session with a story which, which are all familiar with. It's the story of the three little pigs. You familiar with that? The first one built a house uh, made of straw. Let, let's use plastic soda straw. Okay. The second one built the house with styropor and uh, balsa wood. And of course the third built the house with brick, uh, with the help of habitat, I suppose. So, as we all know the story, disaster came in the form of the wolf by huffing and puffing the, uh, the house made of straw collapsed and the poor resident had to evacuate and went to, was relocated to the house made of styropor and balsa wood. But again, the huffing and puffing wolf came again and again the two had to evacuate and they went to a habitat community okay, made of bricks. Well, I guess this story would more or less capture the essence of this afternoon session. We are talking about disaster risk reduction and management. And how does habitat relate to this issue? I guess there are three or four S's that habitat is looking into. First is site. Where do you locate them? Then the shelter. What kind of shelter will you provide them? Then, of course, security and safety. So with that analogy, I would like to start the session. And in the Philippines, where women are held on a pedestal, we would like to start with the ladies first. So let me introduce, you know, we have three ladies and three gentlemen. And uh, our panels, panelists actually represent I would say six different areas of concern or discipline. You have legislation, you have governance, you have social work, you have relief, rehabilitation, and least but, last but not least, and very important, information or communication. So without further ado, I would like to request first, you know, our first speaker who I introduce is really a TV personality by heart and she believes in the power of the video. So we will start this with a short uh, video material which she prepared specially for this afternoon's session. Roll video, please. A picture says a thousand words, and that short video said a million words. So on that note, I would like to introduce our first speaker. We have, of course, a well-known personality in Philippine media and in Philippine politics. She is an advocate for the environment, a strong supporter of women and child rights, of course, a legislator, and I would say still a TV personality by heart. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Senator Loren de Garda, Good afternoon. Am I given my two minutes now? Oh, thank you very much, Make it Ron. three. Yes. Well, um, I assume that not all of you in this room today are Filipinos, so I would have to speak about perhaps Philippine policies and legislation. I'm a Philippine senator, and I authored uh, two of many environmental laws, but perhaps one could be very relevant to today's gathering today. And as chair of the Climate Change and Environment Committees, uh, we have in the Philippine Senate authored the Climate Change Act, which created the Commission on Climate Change. Before 2009, there was no standing committee in the Philippine Senate on climate change. 
uh, because of a Senate resolution, we were able to institutionalize the Committee on Climate Change, which I chair till now, which is my third and last term. But apart from that, in 2007, which was the beginning of my second term, we filed the Climate Change Act. It was not an easy uh, hurdle because at the time, uh, Typhoon Ondoy of 209, which is very devastating, had not happened yet. And so it was quite difficult for me to convince my colleagues then that climate change was a real and present danger, that it could be one of the biggest humanitarian challenges and national security issues of our time. But to make a long story short, we'll be able to pass in record time the Climate Change Act, which created the National Committee on Climate Change uh, National Commission on Climate Change, chaired by the President, no less, with three commissioners. At the same time, we were also instrumental in the passage of the NDREAM-C. That's a National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Law, which created the NDREAM-C Council, which means that every uh, city and municipality or local government unit in the Philippines must have a DRR officer or a Disaster Risk Reduction Officer. So between the Climate Change Act, which created the Commission on Climate Change, and the End Dream Sea Law, which created a position of DRR officer in every local government unit, we hope that the marriage between climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction, or what I would like to call now as resilience, uh, should be able to save more lives to be able to lessen, if not totally eliminate, if it's possible at all, agriculture losses, and to make sure that we are climate adaptive and that we have a resilient economy. What do I mean? In 2009, when Typhoon Ondoy uh, happened, that was in the last quarter, the uh, World Bank estimated that it, took, it had to take um, if I'm not mistaken, 2.7% of our GDP or $4 billion to be able to rehabilitate or reconstruct after Typhoon Ondoy. We are certain that four years thereafter to the present, the Philippine government um, was incapable of having to come up with that amount, whether through the General Appropriations Act or through funds uh, from other sources. But even before we could come up with the complete and total rehabilitation from Typhoon Ondoy. More typhoons and habagats. Habagat means um, no typhoon, but there's uh, rains coming, which brings about floods and um, all the problems that come about with floods. And then, we have, as you know, we have 20 typhoons a year. Then Typhoon Sendong happened in northern Mindanao. And then Typhoon Pablo happened in Region 11, Compostela Valley and Davao areas. Then Habagat happened. So if there was Ondoy, which had an adverse impact of 2.7% of GDP, we had Habagat two years ago, which has a 0.8% of GDP. And I can go on and on. That is the total economic impact of climate change. And therefore, we cannot reverse climate change. We know that. We can only mitigate it. But if we are prepared, and here's the MMDA chair who will speak later on, all of us, we know that if we are prepared, if we actually heed the call of early warning systems. If we actually uh, implement our solid waste management law and segregate garbage at source, then our esteros and canals and waterways will be freed from um, all the solid waste so that water can actually flow during incessant rains. If we do not allow our informal settlers to be living in vulnerable areas on top of what has to be uh, free-flowing areas for water, like waterways and esteros. If we implement environmental laws like solid waste management law, Clean Water Act, etc., then perhaps we will be more prepared uh, when the 20 typhoons or more come every year. And so I'm very passionate about the need for disaster preparedness. I think that a time has come, in fact, we're very much delayed in having that paradigm shift between respond, rehabilitate, and reconstruct, and rescue, which is good, and which is, of course, our duty as leaders of this country and as human beings, but to be able to lessen the negative or adverse impact of these natural hazards, which inevitably turn into disasters, we must be prepared. And so my passion for disaster risk reduction and disaster preparedness and making ourselves resilient is, uh, is, is, is like this. And so I welcome 
um, the opportunity to be able to speak before you here in Habitat for Humanity because you have a big role to play in helping us uh, build more resilient communities to make sure that our building codes, environmental codes are actually followed so that there will be less adverse impact on our vulnerable populations. So I'm sure that there will be a chance to speak more after the, um, the opening statements. I, I wasn't given a time of two minutes. It might have gone more than that. I'm sorry. When politicians speak, sometimes we speak too long. So thank you very much for this opportunity. It's okay, Lauren, because most men here are married, so they know what it is. Um, may I now call on Ms. Alicia Bala, who is currently uh, the Undersecretary of the Department of Social Welfare Development, and she's on loan now to Jakarta through the ASEAN, uh, serving now as uh, Deputy Secretary General of the ASEAN for ASEAN Social Cultural Communities. So, uh, Alice? Okay, thank you, uh, Rod. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you. Uh, my role as uh, Deputy Secretary General of ASEAN is to oversee the different sector under the social cultural, and one of them is environment and disaster management and humanitarian assistance. And I just wanted uh, everyone to know that ASEAN uh, is home to more than 600 million people and has not been spared from different forms of disasters, both natural, because you, you see Indonesia, Philippines are in the ring of fire. And then you have also volcano uh, eruption. So we have a number like, for example, in Indonesia and then also the Philippines. And then typhoons and floods, uh, you name it, uh, Thailand, Myanmar, Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And then when you talk about the natural hazards or man-made, we also have the transboundary haze pollution between member states, like for example, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei Darussalam, Thailand, and uh, yeah, uh, those are four countries. And uh, one of the things that ASEAN has made uh, significantly and a contribution to the world is that we have an agreement. It's an ASEAN agreement on disaster management and emergency response. And this is the first and only one legally binding instrument in, in the whole world. And it has been acknowledged even by UN because uh, each of the member states are supposed to help each other because there are two uh, fold objectives of this uh, ASEAN agreement on disaster management and emergency response. And that is to reduce uh, disaster losses. And secondly, uh, it's a platform for close cooperation between and among the 10 member states. And for those that are not aware, the member states of ASEAN, we have Brunei Darussalam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Lao PDR, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, uh, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. And uh, right now, we also have a platform for coordinating efforts in case one of the member states have been affected by a um, uh, great scale of disaster, and that is the ASEAN Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance. And in short, it's called AHA Center. And this AHA Center provides information on the assets and also the capacities of the member states. Uh, they have uh, an information uh, dissemination uh, unit where they have all this information available that can be shared with the member states. And they are also responsible for organizing the deployment of what we call the emergency response action team to assist, to assist the member state that would require assistance. So one of the basic principles when it comes to disaster response, the member state affected takes the first lead role. It's only when that member state asks for support and then the AHA Center becomes the focal point for coordinating the efforts. And to support this, we also have a logistical uh, system command that is placed in Subang, Malaysia, that can mo uh, mobilize resources, both non-food and food items, including equipment. Like in the case of Typhoon Pablo, uh, our center deployed um, generators and even mobile stockpile vans. So in short, this is how uh, ASEAN as an institution 
response to disaster in the region, especially when a member state has been struck by big uh, typhoons or flooding or the like, or any uh, form of disaster. So in short, later on, uh, if there are some questions, you can ask me about how uh, ASEAN as an institution respond to disaster risk reduction and management. Thank you. The next lady is the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of Rappler Inc. Philippines. She's a well-known TV personality also, having been closely associated with CNN and uh, what station? ABS-CBN, okay. Um, I came from GMA. Okay. Um, she, of course, uh, by the way, uh, can we just give her a greeting? It was her birthday yesterday. Can we just say happy birthday? So tonight she's inviting us all for dinner, okay? Okay, so Maria, please. Thank you. Hello, hello, hello. Check, check. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I will talk about just four things, and I may run a little bit over two minutes, but the four ideas is this. Um, information's role in disaster. It's huge because technology has shifted it so fast right now. Um, it's content creation, which is what everyone can do now that social media is there. You, content creation, social media amplification, leading to crowdsourcing is the third term, and the last term is big data. What do I mean by these four terms, right? First, please raise your hand if you are on Facebook or Twitter, if you're on any social media network, raise your hand. Okay. That's pretty good. 94% uh, minimum, 94% of Filipinos are on Facebook alone. So what does this mean when we're all on Facebook? It means that things change, scale. More than 10 million photos are uploaded every hour. So the time that you're listening to us, there are 10 million more photos uploaded. We click a like button or leave a comment nearly 3 billion times, billion times a day. On, uh, let's click again. On YouTube, there are 800 million monthly users who upload over an hour of video every second. And then if you're on Twitter, the number of tweets grows around 200% a year. And by 2012, these are the last stats I have, it exceeded 400 million tweets a day. When you're talking about these numbers, you're talking big data. Now the question is, how can you use big data? to solve any of our problems. This is not a Rorschach test. This is actually the human superorganism, societies in moments in time. So this is your behavior on Twitter. So these are Twitter maps. If you look at A, that's hashtag Japan in March 2011 during the tsunami and the Fukushima reactor accident, incident, we, they behaved, the Japanese behaved like we Filipinos behaved on Sendong uh, or during Ondoy. We gather and clump around hubs of information. Normally, it's government, like MMDA, gathers a large clump around it, becomes a huge hub and a node during times of disaster and flooding, um, or government, or, or news networks. The second one is hashtag GOP. This was gathered, pulled down. This is the American human superorganism six months before the U.S. presidential elections. And if you look at that, you can see there's no better visualization of how divided Americans were between Mitt Romney and Barack Obama, right? Look at number at C, that's hashtag Egypt. That's what a revolution looks like. This is the point when Egypt toppled a dictator. And hashtag Syria D is, are all the tweets from Syria um, 18 months during into the, the rebellion uh, against President Bashar al-Assad. The question you have is, if hashtag Syria begins to look like hashtag Egypt, can you say that a revolution has happened? Can big data be predictive? Um, embedded in the definition of big data is, yes, it can. Let's go to the Philippines. And it's more colorful because it's more fun in the Philippines. <laughs> 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 uh, this is last year, day 44, the judgment day of the corona impeachment trial. We put it on Rappler. You can zoom in. If you were tweeting during that time period, you'll see the networks you created. Why is it important to see the networks? Because each tie among each of us spreads something. It spreads an emotion or it spreads an idea. In the case of MMDA, we hope it spreads help, which is part of the reason their app works. Let me show you, um, let me show you more. 
August 26, hashtag million people march started on Facebook, right? Seven days after the Facebook post, this is what happened. This is one of the first things where you can see concretely what social media can do. Let's look at what the map looks like. <laughs> Do you see how different this is, hashtag million people march, from the ones before? Because it is exactly like that rally that it created, peer-to-peer -peer networks, no leadership, which means it's kind of chaotic. If you were out in Luneta Park that day, people said, you know, it's exciting, but yet it was boring because there was no one program. So this is the problem with what you have when something is peer-to-peer -peer and disorganized. You need to have some way to actually structure the narrative, structure the framework so you can come up with solutions. Let me just show you the stats very quickly from that day. Um, this is the tipping point. If you look, this is the way things spread. In the virtual world, mirrors the real world. In the virtual world, it took seven days from that Facebook post, but this is already that peak that you see. That peak is 30,000 tweets or Facebook posts, and that didn't happen till nearly 10 a.m. of August 26. So it peaked on social media. Where did we get the 100,000 people out there? 12 noon, 11 or 12. So again, can you tell what is happening in reality based on your behavior on social media? Yes, absolutely. There is something predictive about it. So let's bring this to disaster risk reduction. Next slide, please. Typhoon Bofa is what the international community called it. We called it, Pablo. Um, and these are just some of the horrific pictures from it. Um, this was the worst disaster in 2012. This is what, next slide, this is what the UN, what OCHA did. And what they did is they basically took all the tweets. What we did in the Philippines is we organized ourselves on social media. And we said, let's use the hashtag Pablo PH. And then they gave it to a man named Patrick Meyer. He heads the digital humanitarian. He's, we're working together now on, on this new project called Project Agos. But what he did is he took all the tweets. OCHA gave him 12 hours to collate, geotag, and organize all the information, and the next slide, please, map it. And you can map it. And he did it in 12 hours. The problem, of course, then is that now you have bottom-up civic engagement in a semi-organized way, but how do you have that meet top-down management? And that's what we're trying to do now in Project Agos. It's a bit ambitious, um, but we're working with several of the institutions who have, are dealing with this problem from Climate Change Commission to OCD to um, Chairman Talentino to MMDA. Let's take a look at the three areas where crowdsourcing can happen. Again, I only zoomed into one part. You'll see this already starting in operation, but what you can see is the crowd will come in from the bottom, and the, what is the crowd? They're just volunteers who are on social media. Um, you can scrape all of that big data, who are, which is on Twitter, Facebook. You pushed it, you can map it automatically, so that's an algorithmic-based program. Then you can have the crowd sift through it, and that's something that happened exactly like Patrick Meyer did. Once you have them sift through it, it goes into the database already mapped. The LGUs who are in charge of responding to this, the first responders, the agencies in charge of that, then have access to that information with their own login. They can then come in and actually say, we're sending people to that clump of, of group, this group that needs help in Olongapo. Last Monday, this is what we saw happen. And then you can see this information transparently if you're one of the people looking to see a private organization or an academe, a, a university that wants to send help. Just by looking at it, you can see a big picture idea of where you can help. And one of the things that's fascinating about the Philippines is that we have a lot of people who want to help. They just don't know how. And we haven't really organized our way, ourselves enough to be able to do it. I'm saying now we can. And we can do it in public view, completely transparent. We need to work with private sector, public sector, and media. <laughs> this is a journalist saying that. Um, it works. We've seen it work in small doses. It's a, it's a big, hairy, audacious goal to make it all happen. We think we can get it done. Thanks. Well, if I may add, Risa, the power of media was demonstrated three times. First, we had radio, when the cardinal called on the people to go to the streets, called people power. And then we had Edsados, where they used the text messaging, right? And now, social media, so the power of media.
Now we go to the gentleman. I would like to uh, call now on uh, the chairman. You know, this, this person has a very difficult job, more difficult than the job of the Prime Minister of Singapore. Because we're looking at 14 million people, okay? You know, if New Yorkers have an attitude, uh, Metro Manilans also have an attitude. And it's not easy really for the good chairman to try to instill discipline and uh, make some, you know, make some uh, sense of what's happening in Metro Manila. Metro Manila, as you all know, especially to our guests, uh, is composed of 17 LGUs or local government units. Actually, 16 uh, cities and municipalities and one republic, uh, the Republic of Makati. And, uh, well, our good chairman is very much qualified for the job because, uh, well, for, first of all, he was mayor of Tagaytay City, so he knows local governance. Uh, may I encourage the visitors from abroad, check out Tagaytay. Uh, it's about an hour, an hour and a half from here. Clean air, less traffic, it's more fun there, actually. He's also, uh, right, uh, he was also the president of the League of Cities of the Philippines. And really, it's no mean task to be the chairman of the Metro Manila Development Authority. Ladies and gentlemen, Chairman Francis Tolentino. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank this, take this opportunity to uh, react first to the first three presentations, which would be part of my presentation likewise. I agree with uh, the Honorable Senator that uh, preparedness is a, a vital cog in uh, DRR uh, scheme. Uh, he, she was part of uh, the legislative initiative that eventually uh, transformed MMDA as the head of the MDREAMC, Metro Manila Disaster Risk Management Council. With, uh, unfortunately, yours truly as the head. I agree likewise with the uh, statement made by the, honor, the, the ambassador that there should be a broader regional group that would oversee all of this, considering this is a, not just endemic to the Philippines. Uh, for instance, seated in front of me is the uh, former ambassador to Germany. It is a German flood act, which emanated from, a, from an EU parliament directive. So perhaps the ASEAN can have flood directives that would trickle down to the mem 10 member countries. And I agree likewise with the uh, statement by uh, uh, m m Ms. Reza that Technology would play a vital role, especially during the golden hour. The golden hour is the immediate hour after a calamity. That's where you, you either save or you either save lives or retrieve cadavers. Going back to the MMDA's role, I think uh, what, what is often overlooked is the role of spatial planning. It has to be part. Disaster risk mitigation should not be focus on the subject of flood risk management or event management alone or even earthquake management. We have to go before and beyond. Before would entail the preparedness, the planning process, which would entail probably the revisiting of our existing land use plans, zoning ordinances, including the car current mantra of the World Bank right, right now, which is retrofitting. Retrofitting buildings for uh, possible earthquakes, or even flood proofing of buildings. Uh, if I may uh, share this with you, the, the, the cost of a school building in the Philippines is equivalent, one classroom is equivalent to retrofit, retrofitting six to seven classrooms, and that would save lives. And then we go, we go beyond, and that, that would entail the rehabilitation phase. It would entail resources, and resources should not be left alone to the government. Private sector should help. It has been said, I've seen, I, the last time our agency made contact with Gadavers was last week. We were able to retrieve the last body in Subic Sambales. I, I personally supervise uh, the, the retrieval of 19 Gadavers in New Bataan, Compostela Valley. After the third, the fourth, Retrieval, it, it became uh, just a uh, routinary retrieval process. I asked the staff, I asked the army soldiers that we pray first before we place the body in a, in a body bag. But after the third and the fourth, it became so normal that uh, it, uh, I cannot describe the scenario. 
So, uh, for me, the, the entire process should involve the grassroots. It's, 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 it has to be uh, to the community. We cannot rely alone on heroics. We cannot rely alone on uh, compassion and acts of mercy after an event. It has been said that foreigners, there are lots of foreigners here, would always, would always admire the compassion of Filipinos how we, we rise up again and again because of our quality of mercy. But it has been said also that the Filipinos' quality of mercy should be reinforced by merciless efficiency. And we can do that. We can do that if we have manual of operations, we have good plans, and we have DRRM embedded in our land use planning systems. Good afternoon. We have the Senior Director for Global Disaster Response of Habitat for, of, for Humanity International, U.S. Uh, Mr. Kip Scheidler has uh, 20 years of experience with Habitat, including uh, having positions in El Salvador and uh, Guatemala. Um, here is one man who has seen the effects of so many disasters in many countries. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kip Scheidler. Good afternoon, and yeah, thank you. Um, the question put before us is, is how can we increase efficiencies and increase the impact of the disaster risk reduction work we do? Um, and I'm going to attempt to answer that from the point of view of, a, of an NGO. I think NGOs have a, have a key role to play in this process. Um, first, before I jump into this, how many people in the room, raise your hand if you work with a community-based organization or an NGO, or a church group or civil society? If you, if you work with any of those. Fantastic. And keep your hand up if you don't work for Habitat for Humanity. How many of you work for another agency? Yeah? There's quite a few of you. It, it takes all of us. Uh, we've heard Habitat's name quite a bit over yesterday and today, and, and some of those of us from Habitat have felt a, a little uncomfortable because it's, it's, it's as if we're asking people to, to talk about us, and, and we don't want to. Uh, so I just want to recognize that it's a lot of NGOs that are represented in this room, and the work that needs to be done will be done by all of us together, collectively. Um, but the key, there are two things that I think, think we need to focus on. The first, the first thing is helping connect the policy work that's happening on a high level, whether it's regional or national, with what actually needs to happen on the ground in the communities. I, th I think we can help bridge that gap. Um, that's, and then also help with the actual implementation on the ground. Um, that bridging the gap is going to take advocacy work on, that, on behalf of the NGOs, uh, working with the policymakers. Um, there's a group, the Global Network of Civil Society for Disaster Re uh, Reduction, uh, GNDR, which Habitat isn't a part of, but they have an initiative called Views from the Frontline. And they have civil society organizations in 57 countries in the grassroots level who are monitoring compliance by government against what they've agreed to do with the Hyogo fr Framework. So you have the, the grassroots watching their government and giving feedback as to whether they feel, in the communities, the progress is being made. And, and Habitat's engaged in that process in a few different countries, and I, I think that's a key place where we can play, where we can have an active role. Um, why is it so important to listen to the, to the people in the communities? Um, 50, over 50% of the affected pe people from uh, disasters caused by natural hazards live in fragile or conflict countries. 95% um, of the people that are killed by disasters are from developing countries. 95%. And we know that the majority of disaster losses are due actually to the small-scale disasters. Not the big ones, but the small, the flooding that happens week after week, day after day in all of our countries. And we know that women and children and the elderly are the most effective, affected and the least capable of responding to that sh shock in their life. 
And all, the, all of this is happening in the communities. Um, we had a breakout session yesterday, and there, uh, there was a question if, if anybody in the room was from the Philippines, a lot of hands went up. And then the question was, were any of you Filipinos affected by Sindong? And a hand went up. And the question was, how were you affected? And the gentleman said, my house was flooded. And they said, well, did you have any losses? And he said, well, you know, it's a two-story house. We were able to go upstairs, but everything downstairs was, was lost. And the question was, well, what was lost? Well, my refrigerator, my television, the furniture, uh, my stove. And then the question was, who helped you replace all of that? And the answer was nobody. And quite often, and most often, the majority of the people carrying the burden of these disasters are the poor, are the people in the communities who just have to get over the shock. They have to absorb it. They have to move on. And they do. They do. But that's why they deserve a voice in this process. And that's where I think NGOs can play a, a really important role. Um, the other thing I would say is, is, and I would just finish that by saying, community resilience is the backbone of national resilience. A nation isn't resilient if the communities aren't resilient. And that's where, that's where we work. That's where all of the NGOs and church groups in this room are working. And that's why I feel we have a very, very vital role to play in, in increasing the impact of the DRR work that's being done by all the different players. And then the, the second thing I would say, so it's, it's bridging that gap, and the second thing is simply mainstreaming disaster risk reduction. Uh, we don't have time for it to be an add-on project. We don't have time for it to be something that, that we might do if we get some additional funding. All the different work that NGOs are doing, whether it's, it's with women and children, it's health, it's shelter, it's settlements, education, all of that we need to be talking disaster risk reduction. When we're talking with children, when we're talking with, with mothers, when we're talking in livelihoods projects, we need to be talking about disaster risk reduction. And that's something that we can do every single day. And that's something that isn't going to cost us a lot of money to add on and just incorporate into what we're already doing. So those are the two things, bridging the gap and mainstreaming DRR. Thank you. Last but not least, we have this young fellow. Uh, he is actually uh, the uh, chief executive of Mercy Relief Singapore and uh, it is a non-governmental humanitarian organization providing assistance to disaster-stricken communities across 23, 23 Asian countries. Uh, as we all know, Mercy Relief also manages long-term development projects such as water, sanitation, shelter, sustainable livelihoods, healthcare, and education. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Hassan Ahmad. Best thing. A very good afternoon to everyone, uh, and also a very uh, big thank you to the Habitat for Humanity uh, for inviting Mercy Relief uh, for this forum. Uh, we're just 10 years old uh, this year. We started in 2003, and it was launched by then uh, Deputy Prime Minister, and now who is the Prime Minister, who's not as busy as uh, our Chairman MMDA, as what Rod said. Uh, he's the Prime Minister of Singapore now. Um, Mercy Relief started as, uh, today we are a uh, relief and development uh, organization. Uh, why? Because when we first started 10 years ago, as the name jet, that uh, Mercy Relief is uh, an extension, extend compared through relief work. And uh, along the way, we realized after responding to major disasters like the Asian tsunami, the Muzaffarabad earthquake, uh, the uh, uh, some armed conflict in Sri Lanka, we realized that uh, uh, just what Senator Laganda said earlier, nothing beats preparedness. It's not about being reactive, you know, we have to be proactive. Uh, and in 2008, that was where we actually put our resources uh, uh, into development uh, focus uh, and emphasis also uh, to ensure that we build the capacity of uh, poverty-stricken or impoverished uh, communities to enhance, to lift up to, uh, their capabilities, not just for better lives, but also to better uh, respond uh, to disaster should it hit them. So uh, we identified uh, disaster uh, communities uh, over five countries in uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, of course, the two uh, big 
naturally Philippines and Indonesia would be included because they are the hypermarts and the supermarts of uh, disasters. And uh, uh, so, henceforth, you know, thereafter we uh, we uh, focus further into uh, DRRM, and uh, this is where we feel that uh, uh, both for preparedness and uh, response, it needs greater coordination in the region. You know, uh, a lot of times uh, typhoons uh, uh, passes through two or three countries uh, at one go. You know, uh, the latest uh, wood tip, you know, that goes to China, uh, uh, passing by Zambales. And uh, Mercy Relief uh, has worked in Philippines since uh, Morocco in 2009, thereafter on Doi or Ketsana, and then Washi, and then uh, uh, Bofa or Pablo. Uh, we also have development works uh, which uh, includes uh, DRRM uh, uh, components uh, in Zambales. Uh, we work in Baseco in Manila. Uh, across to the east, uh, we actually work in uh, Bicol uh, for some DRRM projects. And we feel that uh, it, uh, some of, all of these works that we do needs to be coordinated, whether it's for DRRM or for the response itself. Uh, we are extremely uh, optimistic, uh, especially after ASEAN uh, in June, 2000 and June this year, uh, where ASEAN passed, the foreign ministers passed uh, uh, the ACDM or the ASEAN Committee for Disaster Management to partner uh, representatives, uh, CSOs, representing uh, the 10 ASEAN member states. This is to have a better bridge uh, uh, you know, or a partnership or uh, uh, more concerted effort you know, uh, in addressing uh, preparedness and also response. Uh, and uh, I think the next level uh, is in, you know, it would be to bring in the private sector uh, where uh, uh, largely uh, the assets uh, are largely uh, within the domain of the private sector. You know, and I think uh, without resources, uh, uh, ACDM or the CSOs you know, uh, will not be able to do much because concepts will remain concept unless resources are pumped in to bring, us, uh, to bring those concepts to the next level, uh, which is the implementation. Right? So I think uh, 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 this is where also I feel when, with regards to coordination, uh, 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 play international organizations like OCHA, uh, I think needs to, uh, you know, we are, uh, uh, we are anticipating or at least we expect uh, OCHA to take a more uh, active role uh, in leading uh, the sector uh, of uh, DRRM and uh, preparedness and response uh, within the region of ASEAN and also Asia. Right? Uh, so with that, I thank you. Okay, we now come to the... Uh Question and answers. Uh, let, me start, let me first start. Uh, first, may I ask all of you, and you may answer, you, you know, you may answer accordingly. Uh, what kind of, how would you redefine the role of your institution in addressing the challenges of uh, disaster risk reduction and management? Right now, your institutions are in place, but there, there could still be room for improvement. So, how would you redefine it? And if so, what kind of support do you require from, well, there are three Ps, right? The public, the uh, private sector, and the people. What kind of support will you need from these three uh, factors of the equation? Anybody, please? Senator. Maybe I can start as a legislator. While the laws that I mentioned, uh, the Climate Change Act and the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Law have been commended by no less than the United Nations um, Assistant Secretary General Margaretha Wallstrom of the US, UNISDR as the best laws in the world, which has been used as a model for other countries, it should not stop there. And the challenge for all of us is to be able to make these laws work without the cooperation of the private sector, the local government units, the MMDA, the DENR, the DPWH, the media, the citizens themselves, then all the well-crafted laws and policies that we institutionalize uh, would be useless. And so, first, to be able to implement these laws, we must make sure that the citizens are aware that these laws actually exist. Second, that they're actually funded by the Department of Budget and Management, and um, the funds must be utilized efficiently and effectively. 
and of course monitored, etc., to make sure that these actually uh, go to the communities and are utilized for such purpose. And third, so that the funding that we put every year don't just go back into rehabilitation. In a climate change hearing for their budget the other day, uh, Vice Chair Sering said that yes, our budget for flood control has actually increased a thousandfold. I'm not sure the num with regards to the numbers, but it goes to rehabilitation, meaning that perhaps the flood control infrastructure has to be fixed, retrofitted, uh, improved, but it does not mean that we are doing new flood control infrastructure uh, to protect vulnerable communities. And so the challenge for all of us is really to make sure that our laws work to protect the vulnerable communities. And this is really a big, big challenge. And we can only see this if when the hazards come, typhoons, for example, and because of the typhoons, there will be floods, if there would be zero casualty, if there will be less negative impact or um, ne less economic and agriculture losses, we can only measure the effective implementation of our laws if these numbers actually improve in the days or months to come. So laws are useless unless they're implemented by the executive. And the executive cannot be blamed completely because it takes the citizens to be able to help us implement these laws. Chairman, would you care to comment, please, on how in the area of governance you can instill? Yes, I, I agree with the salient uh, points raised by the good senator. Uh, in fact, she was asking me a while ago, what's, how would you delineate your function with that of DPWH? Sabi ko kanina, DPWH uh, performs the infra side. We take over maintenance, etc., etc., with, but with no funds and personnel. So I was thinking... Uh, related to your question on how to improve the functions of our agency and the good senator uh, might be interested to craft a legislative proposal. We have 897 kilometers of drainage laterals and mains within Metro Manila. Some circa 1930s. Some are being maintained by MNDA. Most are being maintained by DPWH. Some are being maintained by city government, some are being maintained and operated by private villages and subdivisions. Uh, do you see the disconnect? 897 kilometers being maintained and operated by different entities. In Hong Kong, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region has one department. It's called the Department of Drainage. Department of Drainage. The good senator with would accept the idea we, we should have a Bureau of Drainage just for the Metro Manila area. Just one entity to maintain and probably interlink this with the current concessionaire agreements with, with the water utilities, which might be, they might be able to uh, utilize some of the runoff water to serve as future potable water for the rest, for the 12 million residents. So, some legislative proposals are probably uh, imperative right now. Uh, we have to delineate the functions and uh, pursue that, what, what I mentioned a while ago, merciless efficiency. If I may, I, this is not part of the format. Uh, I'm glad that the um, Secretary mentioned that. The 897, I wonder if they're all readily available as free-flowing drainage and waterways or which percentage of the 897 have actually been already occupied by informal settlers? So pr probably uh, just by going out... Tell me 50%. Oh, that's causing... Going, the out, going out of this hotel, you'll reach the Don Bosco area. There are diggings there. You have, you have portions of Buendia. There are diggings there. You, ha you have portions of uh, Rizal Avenue in Manila. There are diggings there. So we right now, we have 76 ongoing drainage upgrade program. So 897, there are disconnects. Floods would eventually go to the street level and eventually damage properties, cause traffic jam, etc., etc., including the economy. But of this 897, which are populated by informal settlers? 
I, I'm, I'm, not, I am not so sure of uh, informal settlement popul populations within the drainage systems, but out of our 237 esteros, 55% are not accessible utilizing MMDA equipment or even MMDA personnel because they are thickly populated. Oh, the esteros, the 230 esteros is different from this 897 yes, drainage. Yes, ma'am. So we're talking about waterways here in general, yes. whether they are drainages or esteros. And imagine 55% of the 230 esteros are populated. Yes, That is the answer to the flooding of Metro Manila. And the traffic. Kung walang dadalo yun ang tubig, <laughs> kalahati ng dapat dalo yun ang tubig ay may tao, yes. yun ang dahilan. Yes. I'm, I'm speaking in Tagalog. It means if the waterways are already populated by informal settlers, there goes the answer to the flooding problem. So they must be relocated. Now, yes, whose no. responsibility is it to relocate those people living on what used to be waterways? It's actually we have right now, we have right now an interagency uh, initiative, the, the, the ILG, MMDA, the SWD, DPWH, including the National Housing Authority, our first priority is to have the eight major uh, waterways cleared by December of 19,440 families. So you're speaking of San Juan River, Tulyahan River, portions of Basic River, amongst others. But to cover the entire, the 55% of the 237, it would take years. And these are very vulnerable populations. Definitely. It's for their own good Definitely. that we relocate them ASAP because they live in vulnerable areas hazard when area. rain, hazard areas when rains come. Yes. These are the first that would flood. Yes. Mm -hmm. They can die. It's unhealthy. Yes. And they, they affect uh, the entire adjoining communities. Let me uh, coordinate with your office, and I want to be the author of the bill that would create an agency, whichever you call it, a bureau, or make it under the MMDA to manage the drainage, 897 drainage. But then again, legislation is one thing, but having it implemented is funded another. But funded. let me be part of the solution and let this habitat event uh, be part of the solution, the suggestion of Chair Francis. Very good, Francis. very good. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, thank you. Maria, you want to say something? I think I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think that the, we've all, I've covered disasters in Southeast Asia for almost 30 years, and I think we all recognize something really changed in 2009. And when Ondoy happened, uh, it was drastically different, and now every time it rains, uh, I get scared. And that's also something really new. We don't know, it used to be predictable. It's now no longer predictable. And I think the key thing, I think, and it should be, not just for our institution, but almost everyone now, we are seeing this. Uh, the time to sit back and wait for other people to do something is actually over. And I think that's part of what we heard in their exchange. Some things require political will. If the political will isn't there, do we just sit back? because we're all going to be affected by it. So for us in Rappler, well, Rappler is not a traditional journalist organization, so we've thrown that away and we've decided that um, the word I used the other day, yesterday was enlightened self-interest. It is to all of our benefits for us to, to do something now in our area of influence. Um, we cannot wait for just MMDA or for the law, and we do have good laws, but they're not implemented. So what happens next? It is no longer business as usual. We need to lean in. We need to do whatever we can in our area of influence. May I hear from uh, Alice? Uh, there is an estimation that the average, an, on an annual basis, the losses in ASEAN region is $4.4 billion. And so therefore, ASEAN right now is saying that investment in disaster should be viewed as uh, a very good investment. Because for every peso of, uh, dollar investment of one dollar, you will be able to prevent four to seven dollars losses. And so therefore, the, the ASEAN Committee on Disaster Management, this is the sectoral body that is responsible for the implementation of the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and uh, Emergency Response, has tied up with 
the insurance and finance sectors of ASEAN, and they came up now with disaster risk financing and insurance roadmap. And this is being discussed now, and this is where ASEAN is also uh, putting its uh, attention and advocacy to ensure that ASEAN should be able to cope and uh, should be prepared in responding to or preventing or mitigating disaster in the region. So I think this is where, uh, and what is the, uh, the needed resources? Uh, in November, there will be a partners forum that will be um, managed by ASEAN and it will be held in Hanoi. If you're interested, just let me know and you will get invitation to that event because we thought that partnership not only among ASEAN member states but it should become inclusive, meaning the, the people, the financing institutions, the CSOs, even the media. But right now we have five, or five members, what we call it the ASEAN Partners Group. These are all international organizations and we want to expand that network so that we can have a better um, response to disaster mitigation, um, rescue, rehabilitation, and even uh, especially capacity building for the local communities. So we're just about two years away from our target of one, one vision, one identity, and one community, and that's ASEAN Community by 2015. Thank you very much. I was just going to say, related to relocating the, the, the informal settlements along the waterways, um, there's an aggressive plan here in Metro Manila that actually gave a presentation on it in Washington about a month ago, which was odd for me to do that. But, but it's impressive. It really is an impressive plan. And, and there's money, there's capital, there's political will. Um, the challenging thing is, is finding land that is in good proximity to where the livelihoods are of those families so that they have somewhere viable to go. Otherwise, and we've seen this in other countries, and unfortunately Habitat actually has committed this sin, is, is building, relocating families where there isn't a livelihood and they just go back. They'll be right back in those waterways even though something else is built if if there isn't a good livelihoods option or if, or if they aren't close enough to where their livelihoods are. So, so I think we, someone said it earlier, we know how to, we know how to do it. Um, and, a, and a wonderful thing here in the Philippines is there's the political will and there's actually the money to do it. Um, but there are a couple of pieces to the puzzle that are being really hard to, to get in, into place. Um, so I think we just need, as you said, Maria, just lean into it. I think we need a, a few more people to lean into that issue, and, and I think we can fix it, and, and we can find a solution for those families that are that are that are living in the waterways now. I think we all quite know our roles uh, in uh, DRRM, whether it's at the government and public sector, or the private sector, or the NGO and the CSO, CSO sector. Uh, what is also important, I think, uh, that due to limited resources, I think we must not go into other people's roles, you know, duplicate efforts, you know, and this will lead to a uh, wastage of resources, already limited resources. So knowing our roles is one thing, you know, uh, not going into other people's roles, of course, you know, if they are not doing it already, you know, but uh, I think uh, this is where uh, over the last decade, more than a decade, we saw in many places from in different countries, whether it's in Japan or it's in Pakistan, in South Asia, East Asia, and we realized that a lot of times, there were, uh, you know, duplication of efforts, which actually leads to not just uh, uh, wastage of resources, but also chaos. You know, because uh, you know, if you look at uh, the the Tokyo airport, you look at uh, in Subang, uh, no, sorry, in uh, in the port uh, in uh, Aceh, right? You, 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 we are actually adding burden to already, the already burdened uh, situation on the ground. So I think it's very important for us to know what uh, our roles are and other people's roles, you know, so that we won't uh, trip onto each other. Thanks. Uh, thank you. May we invite now our friends to ask a question? Yes, please. Uh, identify yourself. Danny Medlansakai, uh, Mega World Corporation. 
Well, actually, the only thing that bothers each one of all, uh, each one of us is the problem. That this problem has been going on for the last 30 years, especially the flooding in Metro Manila. I have heard so many forums already to prevent it. I know we have good reaction team all over the Philippines, but that is not so important if we are not going to prevent what is going to happen again. For 30 years, the same areas has been flooding for 30 years. What are we going to do with that? We have so many plans, we have so many plans, we are going to have so many laws that must uh, provide for all of this. But we have this already for the last 20 years. For the reason that the same uh, canals, the same steros, the same uh, problem with uh, people uh, staying in that areas. What are we going to do? That is the only problem that causes us so many uh, sleepless nights. You want to comment, uh, Mr. Chairman? I agree that uh, uh, same recurring problems, problem for the last several decades. I agree. Likewise, that same areas are being flooded. Uh, even during my high school days, same areas. But I think what, what's really different now, and I'm really a prisoner of hope, is that uh, for the first time, we will be, and we are now, and we have relocated informal settlers. We started in San Juan. It has not been done before, even uh, as earlier espoused by former, the late Mayor Arsenio Lacson of Manila during, the, during his uh, incumbency. It has, they have never been relocated. We're doing it now. We're starting it now. And I, I think what, what would be, what would set us dramatically different from the previous years that we have, we have the resolve, we have the technology in place, but it has never been said that Metro Manila can be flood prone. To make it flood resilient is to recognize that Marikina is a flood plains area to recognize that Kamanava is below sea level, Nabotas, the city of Manila, etc. To recognize that we only have three meters of Laguna Dibay that would uh, continuously inundate Muntinlupa, Pateros, and Taguig. But, but the reality right now is that people have come to realize that their safety lies in their hands. So I think it's, it's not just... Uh, as dreaming of having a flood-free metro. It's us pursuing, as what the good senator said, a more resilient Metro Manila. I've, I've mentioned flood retro-proofing of school buildings and hospitals. You have, for instance, UARM in Vimapa, in Santa Mesa. It can be done. Uh, I earlier proposed the utilization of the San Juan River as an alternative to EDSA. I heard a while ago a proposal to revitalize the, the Laguna, uh, uh, the Pasig River Ferry. So I think uh, the difference is that we are starting something new. And it has become, now, it has now been translated into a component of the local planning process. But if I may refer to the first question raised a while ago, my, my dream is to have just one, uh, one Metro Manila comprehensive land use plan. Unless we can have that, we may never be able to address all the other adjoining issues, like for instance, the mere the, the, the existing 10% open space that we have right now for Metro Manila that would no longer be able to uh, capture the runoff uh, water. Uh, you call it stochastic uh, occurrences that are not predictable. You have condominiums, high-rise buildings proliferating, even along EDSA. So we have to have that. 
and I think it would, it would emanate from the now pending in Congress land use, National Land Use Plan. But I agree, uh, it, it has been flooding ever since in España, 70s, two weeks before it subsides, but I it subsides. But I think right now, siguro three hours na lang, it subsides. Uh, I, I, we, we never promised that we, we would be uh, flood free, but uh, to, make, to make the community more resilient is, is perhaps the, the best answer to your uh, current worry. Well, friends, uh, I must apologize. Yes, I'll learn this. Uh, friends, I have, I'm sorry, but we'll have to close this. Um, I was mercilessly told by Kate Maceda that we should end up now. So, anyway, let me just recap what our panelists have said. Uh, the good senator reminds us that we cannot reverse climate change. We just need to be prepared and, to be, and be prepared to save lives. I think that's the, most, that's the utmost goal. Uh, Yusek Bala says that investment in disaster risk and reduction will be made available and should be encouraged, and that mobilizing resources would be a prudent way of addressing the problem. Journalist, if I may call you journalist, Madam Journalist Maria Reza, of course, underscores the importance of data uh, made available in quantity and quality terms no, by the social uh, network. And of course, she had, her concern is about the information from down to top, but now it should also transfer from top to down. Chairman Tolentino, of course, again, reminds us of uh, preparedness. You know, she had something which I think is very, very important. Safety lies in your hands. It lies in our hands. Uh, so I guess that's uh, the key message. And I agree with him, being a resident of San Juan, uh, that th there ought to be a Metro Manila comprehensive, one comprehensive plan. Uh, Kip Scheider uh, mentioned about his concerns about the proximity of land, you know, of the site where the uh, informal dwells will be located. It must be near the source of livelihood or else it defeats the purpose. Right? And of course, uh, Asan Ahmad mentions about the need for coordination to avoid waste and, and chaos, because that can happen really. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very fruitful, I would say, and engaging uh, session. Uh, but before we end, I, I believe, I understand that Senator Lagarda has something to offer us, aside from offering to, 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 uh, to pass a law no? that would create the Bureau of uh, Drainage. Wow. Okay, you want uh, answer? Well, you know, the... Uh, no, the I, lover that Francis she is. and I were, were talking, uh, so thank you for that, Rod. I, I wanted to react to the gentleman's uh, interjection earlier. Yes, we all agree in this room, it's so exasperating and frustrating because it's not a new problem. We've had this for many decades. The only two things I can think of are different now. Of course, we have a bigger population now. And the sorry thing about it is, it's a collective problem. We allowed this, uh, the increase in population, the people, to build their structures on what should not have been built on, namely waterways, esteros. Hindi dapat inalagyan ng bahay dun o structure, pero yun. Pero nandiyan na yun. On the other hand, the good news is, there are laws in place now. 30 years ago, there was no climate change law. 30 years ago, there was no NDREAMC law. And we now have the personnel, the government officers who are accountable, and we now have people aware of this. So hopefully, with the new laws, which are only three years old, even with a burgeoning population and with the violations of the law by structures being allowed to be built on waterways, uh, hopefully with many people helping out, not just people in government and the executive, but everybody helping out, we can surmount these problems, but not overnight. It really has to take the political will and everybody's cooperation. Ang hihingin ko lang po sa inyong lahat at tatagalugin ko ito dahil hindi naman sakop ito ng ating mga dayuhan. Ipatupad po natin ang Republic Act 9003 o ang Ecological Solid Waste Management Law. Ang paghihiwalay ng basura sa nabubulok at hindi nabubulok. Segregation of garbage at source, recycle at compost. After you leave your conference, find out in your home 
I learned so much from the conference, but am I actually segregating garbage at source? Am I recycling? Am I composting? Am I separating the uh, paper from the food waste, from the plastics and the metals, etc.? If you're not doing that, then do it soon. If your barangay or your subdivision or your village of your city or your municipality is not doing it, urge your LGU, your local mayor, to do it. Otherwise, mount a campaign on Facebook, on Rappler, that it's not being implemented because that law was enacted into law in my first term, January of 2001. If it's not being implemented, then that's something to act on. I know we act on many things. We love to do many things on social media. Instead of destroying each other, let's make sure that we make sure the laws are implemented and encourage everyone to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Zampa. Well, well said. Well, before we turn over to Sidling, let me just uh, end the session with a, with a beautiful reminder from Charles Swindoll. If you know him, Charles Swindoll. He said, and uh, Chairman, please listen to this because this can also reinforce your belief. You're being a, a hopelessly, um, we call that your eternal hope. No? We are all faced with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. So on that note, thank you very much, and may we ask now.